to the Temple Hay Show on Fire for Life. And that's just a, a wonderful thing. I don't know about you, but when I hear that, I think to myself, "Woo, I need to perk up a little bit. <laughs> and so we're greeting you today from the heart of uh, Santa Barbara County. But people tune in to our show either live now and or they tune in uh, really from all over the world. We're delighted that you're here. You know, part of uh, my intention always with the show is that we have uh, dynamic guests that are difference makers, that are change agents, and that are supporting the consciousness of what we believe, that we're here to live a full life of vibrancy and, and joy and walk through our shadows and get more joy. But we are here not to be robotic, but we are here to enjoy and experience our, our humanity our guest today is Sandy Robertson. We're delighted to have her. We're going to be talking to her in just a moment. I want to thank our thank our sponsors from Global Peace Workers. I want to thank you very much. And I want to thank our sponsors from ILLI, the Institute of Leadership and Lifelong Learning. We are so blessed. And for all of you tuning in in live time, please feel free to ask your questions in the chat room. I can actually see them and I will coordinate that with Sandy. Sandy, welcome to our show. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you, Temple. Thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to be here today. I've, I've really enjoyed reading about you. And um, as I like to say, any friend of uh, Dia Chandra <laughs> Hunter, uh, she's my publicist too. Any friend of hers is a friend automatically of ours. And, um, when I was reading about you, I, I thought, wow, you know, it, it even had so much more meaning, uh, Sandy, because you've experienced on the side view and the real view what it can look like in the healthcare system. I don't know if you know this, but I was a motivational speaker trainer for the healthcare industry for a long time. And I do think that's one reason I started taking better care of myself. <laughs> right? Yes. I yes. mean, ooh, I think I need to take better care of myself. So um, anyway, let's talk about your journey because I think it's important for people to know that I started here, I got some experience, and, and now I'm there. Tell us all about you, girl. Thank you. Thank you, Temple. Well, I always wanted to be a nurse from when I was six years old, just a clear path to helping people. And why, why would you say that is? Did you have a memory of somebody else that was a nurse or you saw it on TV or you just knew? Intuitively, you just knew. I think it was intuitive. Uh, my mother was actually an economics major and my father was into banking. So my mother couldn't understand it. She would say, I don't know where you got this from. But my grandmother lived with us and she was ill for many years. Mm -hmm. But maybe intuition or life experience caring for my grandmother wanted to help people get better. Uh, the sidebar that goes along with the book is that I was heavy as a child and my grandmother living with us who loved heavy, she was from German ancestry and rich, delicious, heavy foods. My mother tended to cook like that. And so that formed uh, a lot of who I was you know, being shamed a bit in elementary school, you know, fat and fat. So, but then interestingly in junior high and then high school, I lost weight, but it was a lot of my life an up and down battle. And interestingly, my dad was an alternate to the Olympics for track and field. So wow. he was a disciplined eater and very mindful before I had ever heard mindful eating. And he could say, no, thank you. I'm full you know, no, I don't care for dessert, even on a holiday, which was fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. But then becoming a nurse, as you've witnessed uh, Temple teaching healthcare employees, many are actually overweight healthcare employees, and many patients in the hospital are overweight and have chronic diseases. So I started putting the pieces together about the long-term impact of obesity on the cardiovascular system and diabetes and joints. And so that propelled me into wanting to focus on wellness and prevention in my career and my master's program in community health and focused on preventive uh, wellness medicine. And 
then going along corporate wellness i loved it but i started uh, being asked to look into why people were sick or the costs to corporations and interestingly it wasn't necessarily cancer or heart disease it was mental and nervous conditions or psychiatric conditions mm -hmm. addiction issues i thought that is so interesting even people who took care of themselves physically had other issues going on in their lives which of course makes sense so i started learning about the mind body spirit connection psychoneuroimmunology went to harvard and took a week-long course dr herbert benson who started the relaxation response uh, phrase and book and training so that propelled me into wanting to focus my career on holistic approaches integrative approaches the mind body spirit and energy system connection i love that um and, and as you were, as so many, and I think it encourages people that are listening to the show, your, your desires or your soul fulfillment or whatever you want to call it, you get uh, experience in life that somewhat shapeshift you to have a broader understanding so that when you do deliver conversations or you write a, ba a book about seven paths or whatever you do, it's people get it, they can feel it, they can hear it, that, oh, this person knows, you know, they they have experienced it, they have witnessed it. And it is interesting how there is such an incongruency with um, healthcare professionals, as well as spiritual leaders and ministers, people that are in positions to provide caregiving. It, it's interesting because as I've like you, I went on a path like, well, why is that? You know, because um, where does that martyrdom come from? That, oh, sure, I'll just do a 48-hour shift. And it's more than, oh, I get overtime, you know. But it, it is pretty fascinating, you know, how that works. And, and so what I um, discovered is that a lot of caregivers are, are wounded healers. I was just about to mention right. that, which I'm, they're, yeah, of course. They're, they're wounded healers. And so there's a level of um, martyrdom and shadow work that needs to be done because otherwise um, there's no taking care of self. So I too have found that fascinating, both in the healthcare sector where I worked for a long time and also in the ministerial component too. You know, like you're saying, we have a lot of addiction, obesity, um, it, you know, it's just across the board. So I'm glad you're taking a stand and offering viable solutions. I think sometimes it's helpful if we just get to the truth of something and say, let's be real. You know, um, let's look at how we're not walking our talk and how we could model that and i'm still fascinated that you were overweight as a child because i don't see that <laughs> obviously you had some changes <laughs> yes and i'll say to this day looking at pictures of myself when i was six seven eight nine ten years old it's painful mm -hmm. seeing that child and i'll say that there were things going on in our home a lot of emotional upset with my grandmother living with us and so I can now say I know I used food to self-soothe and for comfort and for fun, for entertainment, for many things, which I actually write about in my book, because I think many people do use food for self-soothing, mm -hmm. comfort, entertainment, and maybe they're a little bit aware of it, but not how much. And maybe some of the deep emotional issues or perhaps trauma that's underneath it. So I really want to lift people up, you know, into the light of it's okay to shine light mm -hmm. on some of the true deeper reasons why we're craving food all the time for whatever reason that has nothing to do with do we need fuel. Right. Or protein. Right. Another way we're so duped. You got to yes, have protein. Right. And you got to eat animal protein. It's like, oh my gosh, do you realize what you're eating? Um, well, I um, I applaud you for, you know, writing the book. And um, 
and taking a statement and stand from your experience to help others. That's uh, not only beautiful, it's very encouraging for sure. And, um, and like you said, to, to shine light on things, you know, it's like, uh, one of my friends, she lived to be like 92. She wore blue jeans and everything up until she was in her nineties. She was so cool, little tiny thing. And she would say, you know, when we know better, we'll do better. Uh, right. When we know better, we'll do better. And um, what you're saying is we know better now and we need a few more people, you know, doing better. Um, you know, for sure. And one of the things that, that I have noted in, in my own life um, about people and cultures um, and like where I came from is that people tend to be eating the same way that their parents ate and the same way their parents would be eating um, back then. And it's like, as you change, as your vibration changes, you probably want different things. Do you agree? Does that oh, resonate? Yeah, you want absolutely. different things. Not the same thing. So we're not able to eat those meals that grandmother used to make us because our body doesn't resonate with it. And I know that one of the things I, I said in my own book is that you can lie to your body, but your body can lie you down. And I think that's your book. Why am I eating this? You know, uh, why am I eating this? Is you're addressing a lot of that. Well, tell us some teasers that you would be happy to share. <laughs> I don't want you to tell us about the whole book because we want people to go to the website, energyworkswisdom.com and uh, purchase the book. Is this the kind of book you give to your family, uh, your cousin? people that you've been wanting to tell something to, but you're like, Oh, read this book. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And it's light. I tried to make it light and fun yet with research and evidence-based info in it, because mm -hmm. even the question, why am I eating this could be serious? Like, why am I eating this? Or it could be funny. Like, really? Why am I eating this right now? Or why do I want to eat this? Or why am I about to eat this? So, those are some quick pearls, but you actually touched on one of the pearls temple. And that's, I titled a chapter uncovering the mystery of your eating history, mm -hmm. because I do think a lot of people, and I was like that for a long time, you just get used to eating, not just certain foods, but amounts of food mm -hmm. or frequency or snacking. And those are your eating patterns. So for, I've counseled thousands of people trying to lose weight. And one of the biggest things that people realize right away is their portion sizes are too large and they're eating too fast. Mm -hmm. So I include a lot about mindful eating because it is a transition from perhaps how we grew up with large portions and eat everything on your plate mentality to, okay, what does my body need at this time? How much is enough? I love that question. You know, how much is enough? We go to restaurants, the portions are this big, it could be four dinners. So being aware of our nutritional needs based on our energy expenditure is really important not to be obsessed. I'm not saying you know, people need to be obsessed with calories, but I think an awareness is important. If mm -hmm. say a, the average caloric intake might be 1400 calories a day for a woman or 1800 calories a day for a man, depending on how much you exercise, what does that look like? You know, someone could consume that in breakfast, lunch, or dinner or snacks. Right. So that fine tuning, what does my body need in terms of nourishment? So I include in my book a lot on mindful eating, slowing down, smaller portions, chewing, you know, the mm -hmm. beauty of chewing, uh, a lot on paying attention, a lot. Um, there's a chapter on self-talk. People who are familiar with cognitive restructuring and psychology, you can take many versions of that with how we speak to ourselves around food, being our own best coach. Of course. Like, yeah. How much is enough? Okay, do I really need this big a portion, you know, versus this size? Mm -hmm. And then as we're eating, the self-talk of slow down, you know, put my utensils down, and even being able to say stop. 
especially if we're around people who are eating and eating fast and eating a lot. I think positive self-talk, which I include in the book, is, is so important. It's okay for us to take care of ourselves and say, stop, I've had enough. Well, I think your your question is is a question that could be used many times a day. <laughs> yes. And why why am I eating this? And I in my own um, search and and determination to be a vibrant, energetic presence, regardless of the number of years that I accumulate. Um, one of the things I have learned deeply is there's no one size fits all. Exactly. And, um, you know, people will ask me, like, why did you become a Cheegan? And a Cheegan is a vegan that will cheat every now and then about something. But for me, it's it's never about eating animal protein. I can't believe I ever did that. But I grew up on a dairy farm. Mm -hmm. We had a full freezer and um, and we didn't do it uh, the barbaric ways that they do now. But still. I can't imagine that I ever did that. But uh, Sandy, I was in the military. Oh. And um, what I observed in basic training is I would say, I think that meat was the same we had yesterday. They just added water. You know, so it was like, I don't think I, I think I'll pass. Right. And and then I would pass again. And so a month went by. And I think this is powerful, and I'm sure you state this in your book or work with your clients about this. Instead of saying, I'm giving up something for the rest of my life, which makes you automatically defensive and neurotic, just say, I'm going to try this for a month. And Excellent. that's what I did. You know, mm -hmm. I, I did that for a month, and the next time I ate animal cow meat, I felt like I had eaten cardboard. And it would not move. It is just not a, a digestible food to have. And so I was like, you know, I could do without that. You know, I could, I could do without this. I could do about that. I was a child that <laughs> went to the doctor for allergy medicine because nobody had common sense to say, you know, cheese is not good for you. And it doesn't help your bones, and you're probably allergic to dairy. <laughs> That's amazing. That's it's amazing. <laughs> no, it's it's frightening. It mm -hmm. ought to be illegal. Um, with everything that we know and everything we can research, that people don't learn and and know and. You know, people will will be around me or they'll come over for dinner and, and they'll go, do I need to become, you know, a, a vegan like you? And I go, absolutely not. I don't need a club. I'm just <laughs> following my own path. You need to follow your own path. And by the way, I, I made you salmon. I know that's what you like. But no, I but it's not one size fits all. You said it perfectly. You mm. said it perfectly, Temple. And. I believe when people bring in awareness of their minds, bodies, spirits, and energy systems into that whole mix, and you touched on a lot of that and how you were speaking, it's each person is totally different and a unique mind, body, spirit, energy system, changing every day based on where we are, if we're out you know, in the environment, exposed to things, or in an office building or an airport. And so tuning in to what our bodies need and what's best for us like you said to have our optimal energy takes a constant vigilance and awareness but in a fun way and asking those questions what does my body need right now maybe it's calling a friend maybe it's water maybe it's more sleep but just being aware of that circle of health of mind, body, spirit, and energy system, and the nourishment that we need could be something different than a bowl of cereal or mm -hmm. a snack. Yeah, I love I love how you're addressing it with the full aspect of who we are because you know it it's like um, I say in my teaching. There's the component of what am I eating. There's also the component of what's eating me. You know, yes. what, 
Yes. What's in my psychology? What's happened to me in the last 24 hours that that I'm a little off? Um, what's going on? What occurred like in a sleepless night? Um, and it, it's learning to really know yourself, not obsess, you know, I don't want to be like so, you know, like for me, I want to eat every day, no later than 530. Mm-hmm. But Sandy, when you invite me to dinner in LA, and I'm sure you will, I, you know, idea, I'm not going to go, I got to eat by 530. You know, that's going to be one of those times that it requires inclusion. But I know that's what works best for me is to eat earlier in the day. Um, mm-hmm. I can't imagine, and it's not a great thing, going to bed on a full belly. And there are people throughout our nation that they do that. They they cram and cram and cram and cram, and then they try to sleep, and the digestive system has to work overtime. And it's not a it's not a good ride. It's not a good ride. No not at all. And it's not caring for ourselves and practicing self-care, self-love and self-compassion, which I also weave into my book, as I'm sure you know, because I there's so much in the media, Temple, about food and diet and what diet to be on. And I just really believe that people have missed the mark on it's not just about what diet to eat. It's what does my body and energy system need? It's so unique for me. Like you said, every day it's different. And if we are caregivers or have a job that involves caregiving, mm-hmm. our energy systems can be depleted. And so we need to practice you know, additional self-care and self-love and self-compassion. And as you witnessed, the many uh, healthcare workers who for various reasons probably don't take good care of themselves. It's important for everyone to do that. Well, and so many of them that I met through the years, they are, like I said earlier, they are wounded healers. And, you know, back in the day, um, you know it and I know it, um, and I applaud all nurses because I'm terrified of needles except acupuncture. Um, I don't like to see any suffering. I mean, I see psychology, psychological suffering and neurosis suffering and a lot of suffering. I'm not making light of it. I'm simply saying that you deal with, you know, like from ER, scenes from ER or Chicago Med and that, that's, that's heavy stuff. I, I can't imagine. But the thing of it is, is that nurses back in the day, you know, they had the freedom and the ability to serve the patient. And then what happened, if, if if those of you that are tuning in aren't aware, it became about a budget. And it became, and I can't speak to every healthcare place in the nation, but many that I had the privy of being aware of, of administrators talking to me, they went, that's been taken away from us. We have to manage care by the bottom line. And um, and it took away a lot of the heart of caring. And and more than ever, we we do need to get involved with our own healthcare system and with our own health and our bodies um, so that we can stay healthy and stay at home. You know, back in the day, you went to the... Um, you went to the hospital to get better and now you're taking a risk. I don't know what's going on with this little thing, but it just wants to be noticed. So I'm just going to say, hello, everybody. This is my little ear thing. It just really wanted to jump out and say, hi, that's like its third or fourth time. And this has never happened. So I'm like, okay, am I hearing him? Am I listening? But, um, anyway, I, again, like I said earlier, I just, um, I applaud you for that that different window. And years ago, uh, I taught a course, The Only Diet There Is by Sandra Ray. I don't know if she's still around or not, but we're going back a ways, like in the in the 80s. And it talked about how so many people, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years old, still live with this vibration of what it was like at the dinner table growing up. 
And you, of course, said that. You said that just as well, if not better. That there's that physiological adjustment, that awareness within us that gets tense and tight, because if that was our experience at the dinner table, that was mine. Not not good. Always tense. It wasn't like, oh, how was your day? And let's get to know each other better and bonding. It was very uncomfortable. And so to break that pattern, it, right, and not put that in, in the food, when I would say, I have no desire to eat that where you're going to, you know, force feeding. That's awful. That nobody should ever do that to a child no. ever. Wow. No, mm -hmm. no, it's those emotions. I believe are mixed in with the food and what kind of energy is going into our body then to nurture it. Yeah. And so I love a lot of the the principles of mindful eating, even if you don't call it that, of mm -hmm. being present with food and saying some kind of prayer or grace or showing simple gratitude before a meal to help that transition to I'm about to nourish my body, especially if a lot of people and actually our family does sometimes watch the news, you know, while eating and oh. you have to be Really, no way. Oh, no way I could do that. <laughs> well, it involves turning down the volume or <laughs> turning on the Food Network or HGTV <laughs> or something instead. Oh, but being intentional about mm -hmm. the atmosphere is so important. And in fact, what you were talking about with emotions in the gut, I included a section in my book on the gut brain connection. Mm. And I think it's great that there's so much out there now in research for people to understand that our gut, what's going on with all the, the even good bacteria there affects our brain and brain chemistry. And then it's a bi-directional pathway. So what's going on in our brain with our brain chemistry, emotions, even upset can affect our stomach and digestion. So back to the theme of being tuned in to so many things, uh, I think it's, great awareness and it can actually be fun to just notice what's going on with my gut. Okay. What's going on with my mind, emotion, spirit, could they be affecting each other right now, depending on how I'm feeling? Well, you, you make a, a, a great point. Sometimes if there can just be a space, you know, before we put something on the plate, and it, those simple questions, do I need that much? I mean, that's what I do. Do I, do I need that much as I'm, you know, and I've usually made it, you know, so if I need that much. Um, and do I have enough that's alive? I, I think that is very important. And by alive, I mean um, alive like lettuce, uh, you know, like a spinach, like something, mm -hmm that has life. A lot of people aren't willing to go raw. Um, that even though being a vegan and eating raw is nothing, you know, like it, like it used to be. But to ask that, you know, how is my food balance? And I worked with a, um, with a person um, uh, in Jamaica and we did a real fast, uh, we did uh, miso soup and azuki bean juice for a month. Oh, my goodness. Okay. With uh. special teas. Now, it was monitored. We did that for a month. And then we got to incorporate a little bit of rice and a little bit of garlic. Wow. He said that the American people... They do these funny things like fast. Like I'm going to go three or four days and I'm going to not eat this. And that's very admirable. But his studies prove that that's what a person will do. And then they eat four times more than they ever ate and worse than they ever have. Because it's like, give me, give me, give me, give me. So he said that when you fast of any kind of extreme, you want to incorporate slowly certain foods 
back into your program. Mm -hmm. And that made, uh, you know, perfect sense to me. And I've, you know, continued to, to live by that because it does, it does make a difference in some things you don't want to pick up again. I'll tell you a funny story. Mm. It's that um, when I used to drink my Boone's Farm wine um, actively, I was very committed, um, should have had stock in the company. But anyway, drank a lot. And through those years, people would say, um, mm. do you like sweets? <laughs> <laughs> I, see, I turned red. It's almost embarrassing because I would say, Oh no, I you know, I don't really care for sweet things. <laughs> I mean, wine and alcohol is sugar in a jar. Are you kidding me? So all those years, you know, about uh, fifteen, uh, it was like, no, I no, sweets don't tempt me at all. Drink, 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 drink. <laughs> as soon as I got sober, girl, bring on the chocolate, bring on the sugar, bring on the we used to make like potato cakes that was flour, sugar, and something else that ought to be, you know, against the law. But what I started observing, again, spaces between what I had been doing, I observed that I had the shakes. Wow. And I had the reaction. Hmm. And I had the, I'm hungover, um, just like I did back in the day, that it would take me all all day to recoup from, you know, the night before and probably everybody else <laughs> yeah. that had been around me. But that being said, so um, it's the, I think you're just nailing it. You know, why am I eating this? Why, why am I doing this? Why are these my choices? And do I have the kind of relationships with people um, you know, as a couple or best person or family system that I can do what serves me best and not feel obligated. And I think that my sense is that, I mean, people don't do it to me because I've taught people how I want to be treated. Mm -hmm. But Sandy, I, I wonder how many people in a family system eat because of nicety, not desire. We'll sit and feel like, well, you made it. And, you know, here we go. I mean, I've been to parties and, and people have said, we're so excited you're here. And we ordered all this. And I know there's not one thing I can eat. Um, and I just am used to that. So I bring something very gently very classy in my purse mm -hmm. or in my little ice chest. And I just will take care of myself, you know, uh, to the side without making a big deal out of it. But <clears throat> I wonder, what do you think about, about that, that I need to be nice. Oh, you made this and I don't really want it. I'm trying to take a break from X, Y, and Z, but people do it anyway. And why is that? Why can't we just say, I don't desire that and call it a day. It's a probably $64 million question temple yeah. for another, well, for if another you, episode. If you find the answer, can we split the money? Yes, <laughs> yes definitely. Definitely. A split great. I, I really think it goes back to food is love. Mm. And is even love. in homes, and I'll use mine as an example, even with a lot of, negative emotion going on, food was still love. So I think that for me, for example, wanting to turn to food in the midst of a lot of chaos at times, not always, but at times, it was a good thing. Food was love. Mm -hmm. And so I think therefore it's hard sometimes for people to say no thank you to food. I've had clients say to me, well, how do my trying to lose weight? My wife made this i don't want to hurt her feelings yeah. and it's about it's back to self-care and self-love to be empowered enough to say thank you so much for making this for me i so appreciate it but however people want to say the words it's not going to agree with my body right now or i'm really trying to eat less and take care of myself in a different way or perhaps 
you know, for you, someone might say, it no longer agrees with me. Thank you so much. I so appreciate it, but it, it just no longer agrees with me. Mm -hmm. I tell people sometimes I feel really fogged the next day if I eat certain things, especially sugar. You know, they'll say, wouldn't you like dessert? And I'll say, no, thank you. I'll have a little. And I'll say, I don't feel good when I eat mm -hmm. sugar. So people, every one of us needs to find a way to gently let people know that we appreciate it so much, but it just really doesn't agree with our bodies at this time. But I think people have a greater respect for you when you are, yes. when you just set, set boundaries. And, yes. you know, I go out with people and it's like, oh, we're going to get a dessert. We're going to split it. And they're coming around they're giving the spoon and I go, no, thank you. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would cost me three days. I mean, I would just be like on the side of the rock going, oh, I feel so <laughs> awful because I just haven't done it. Well, first of all, you and I know that it's impossible. I think this is safe to say if I'm wrong, please tell me. But it's almost impossible to live in the uh, in the land of America unless you grow your everything and you slice everything and you make your own sauces. Sugar is in a lot of things. Um, but in choosing not to have sugar, and then you do, oh my gosh, it's like the worst feeling ever. So people go, oh, it tastes so good. Yeah, it's good going in, but it's not <laughs> worth three days. It's not worth being upset. It's not worth, uh, you know, road rage. It's not, use, you know, not worth all the things of how it changes you chemically. And I think people, like you're saying, don't realize that as much. It's not just something I'm partaking in. It's fun. Right. It's not a trend. It's not a, it's not a trend. And you probably remember the book, the sugar blues. Mm -hmm. I remember in the eighties mm -hmm. and I remember then being aware, reading it of, wow, you know, sugar affects your brain mm -hmm. and back to everyone's physiology is sensitive. So, and different. And I know people who can eat sugar and they think for them that, you know, it's fine, no big deal. Mm -hmm. But if you're someone I'll say I am that, you're just more sensitive to different substances, it does affect us much faster and the next day and the next day. And Absolutely. Well, I, I think part of it, and I trust I didn't talk on top of you, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think a part of it is that, and I don't know why, but often we have the tendency to trust the masses. So, for example, flip-flop, are good for you if you wear them just from the house to the beach on a rare occasion. If you wear them uh, every day, you might be getting a knee replacement. <laughs> and your, your hip is out of balance. Am I right? That's because because yeah. you shuffle your feet now, because you squeeze with your toe and you drag your shoe. And before you know it, you can be 40 and you're walking like you're, you know, 110. Um, so, but we, we trust things. Uh, when we went to um, Cologne, Germany, on, a, on our cruise, um, we took a private tour of a chocolate factory in Cologne, Germany. And we were shown how, back in the day, uh, chocolate was such an expensive luxury. Mm. Right? Real chocolate. That they literally had these... Uh, what are you, not a pot, but it looked kind of like a teapot, but it had a lock on it. Wow. It had a lock on it. And so the servers would serve the rich and turn that key and they had little bitty servings. And now you look everywhere, down every counter, everywhere you go, it's not even real chocolate, I'm sorry. It's got probably brown food coloring. I don't know. But I just know that it is not, you know, raw cacao and things like that within uh, moderation can be really good for you. Yeah. But at the level that you and I could just talk all day because we are so in harmony with each other. And I didn't start out this way, but I have learned through 
the desires of what I want long term because we're not even addressing sugar and fibromyalgia. We're not addressing sugar and uh, arthritis. We're not addressing sugar and muscle and, and joint ache. We're addressing somewhat the brain. Um, and Sandy and I, aside from we want you to buy her book, I mean, we, we're not trying to sell you something. We're not trying to give you the objection uh, to what we do in our diet and say, but you today could have this. You could get this box of goodies that could change your life. We're just talking from our experiences. And um, it's important, you know, to hear this information. We're not knocking any company. We're just saying just because something is featured and because it falls down on your Facebook feed and everything else, question it. Muscle test. I think if there's a tool that anybody's doing, aside from getting your book, you know, I, I think that people need to learn how to muscle test. You muscle test your supplements. You muscle test your food, uh, your intake, um, or the boy you're dating. You better muscle test him too. <laughs> now, it's important to ask your body, my body wants this. My body wants this. No, it doesn't. That is a uh, BB, um, my partner, she tests everything uh, she's a cancer thriver i think that's a great great tool reminder there are different ways to do mm -hmm. muscle testing or test things energetically and it's true every we're all different and and what works today maybe not tomorrow so knowing what's best for our energy i do it with food you know if it's still okay to eat it just is it past due? Well, I don't know. You know, some people smell it, but I, I muscle test it, energetically test it. So it's important for us all to stay tuned in yeah. and to love ourselves enough to put the best energetically healthy food into our bodies. And then to remember the other pieces too, the, the spiritual, the sleep, the social network and connection and and our beautiful energy systems to have the most vital energy. I mean, you talked about temple thinking about the long term. I think when we're people, certain ages aren't so much thinking about long term. How do I want to feel? Although I've met some 20 somethings lately who are, who are much more tuned in to, and being aware you know, they don't want to just uh, succumb to the trends and thinking about what's best for their mind, body, spirit, and energy system for the long term. And for mm -hmm. starting young to change their relationships with food and eating, which is really at the heart of my book, too. That we yeah. can all, no matter where we are in life, stop and pause and re-choose our relationship with food and eating for good. Absolutely. And, and I do want to be inclusive. I am aware at certain lower income places that you know to go and well first of all being blunt half the things you buy and it's supposed to be organic not um a farm raised a lot of it isn't accurate information we know that from the film on netflix you are what you eat um i couldn't hardly sit through that I cried several times, so that tells you, you know, a little bit about me. But that being said, um, I would just want to acknowledge because that is another thing in our society is uh, with people that have food stamps and, and people that um, they don't have the means, at least right now, they, they can't have access to some of these things. So we're we're at a balance as a culture. And if you are one of those people and you're saying, well, these are great ideas. What I, what I want to say to all of you um, is that there was a time when we considered life to be sacred. There was a time when we considered animals to be sacred. 
we would think two and three and four times before we took the deer, killed the cow, whatever we did. We are now mass producing. We have billions of lives of sentient beings every year that are killed and never make it to a table. So maybe you don't want to listen to the real stuff, but that is through international uh, humane society. Those are facts. That's not Simple Hayes' opinion, but we have lost this discounted, uh, forgotten, went to sleep. I don't know how kind we can be, but we have lost the sacredness of life. And so if you're sitting there going, you know, yippee, yippee, you know, these women, they keep talking about food and on your <laughs> plate and looking and I can't afford this or that. No, maybe not. Not today. But you could start treating yourself as you are sacred and life is sacred and start there. So whatever you're eating, whether it's being a carb, totally carbaholic, Bless the food. Bless what you have. There's a there's a joke um, that when I was in my 30s, I was around a professional gourmet chef. Uh, she had studied in Paris at college. Um, she ate. Um, I mean, she now uh, soon will be going into her 80s, and she can run circles around anybody in the 60s. But I remember Sandy. Um, back in my 30s because like you were saying it's also what we're used to and you know what we think about or quick food through a drive through and all that but um i didn't recognize half the stuff in her refrigerator i don't i don't know what this is i i don't know what to do with this you know and now that's my refrigerator people say that to me so it is a process um, it really is a process, but you start where you are and you just be willing. So if you just start with, I'm sacred, life is sacred, um, it makes a difference. Absolutely. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. But you said temple. I agree. I, I agree. can't tell you the many days in my life I've cried over where we what happened? I don't know. Um, I can only voice my opinion and pray it has a ripple effect with somebody or somewhere. Um, that's all we can do. I know that my nonprofit, Global Peace Workers, sends funds to Kenya, but that was the stipulation. You know, we will support farm animals, but they are not to be slaughtered. Mm -mm. Can't be part of that. <laughs> beautiful. That's beautiful. Can't be part of that. Not necessary. So. I'm sure your message is reaching millions with your message of sacredness of life and food. And I, it's such a beautiful message. And I also appreciate that you brought up the economic issue of mm -hmm. a lot of things that people who can afford more, you know, organic food, etc. I do want people to remember that the dollar store and dollar you know, outlets like that have vegetables and fruits. And also I remember when I was on, you know, student budgets, buying mm -hmm. frozen vegetables and mm -hmm. having in the, you know, the old block of frozen spinach and putting some Parmesan cheese on it or something. So there, there are ways that even frozen vegetables, which are healthy because they're you know, flash frozen, can be healthy with other say healthy pastas or things with people with family. So I, mm -hmm. and processed food, actually what, you know, junk food can be very expensive these days. It can. Putting the emphasis back on nutrition, even for family serving many people, there are things that can be done with a lot of vegetables and grains and other things, beans to serve nutritious food. Mm -hmm. You know, some yeah. of foods from other countries. I love being impressed by, you know, dishes from around the world of, oh, yeah. of ways to serve large portions and it's still nutritious. Absolutely. Well, um, Sandy and I are just asking <laughs> that you would be willing, you know, and just pick one thing. Um, 
in ways that you would be willing. And I think that's been true for my life, just being willing. And you just do, you pick one thing and you do it for 30 days. And if you're a person, and I just want to be clear when we said one size fits all, because you know how the argumentative defensive personality can get going. Um, no, I didn't say um, wrongful eating habits cause arthritis, <laughs> joint aches, and fibromyalgia. I, I didn't say that. I simply said it can be a factor. And, and, and I've seen it many times with people I've worked on as an energy healer. It is a factor. And I needed to experience it myself to convince, to see. Because back when I told you, when I was first coming into sobriety, my joints ached. When I didn't have sugar for a month, because I picked one thing, and, and then I did, they ached again. There, it is, it really is. So that's our, that's our call, is that you go to uh, Sandy's website, energyworkswisdom.com. That's Energy Wisdom Works. Energy works wisdom. I want to do it backwards. Here we go again. It's energy works <laughs> with an S W O R K S. It's in the in the chat. Wisdom.com. Go to the website. Um, get her book um, so you can have a, a different relationship with knowing why am I eating this? <laughs> and um, look, there we go again. <laughs> That's a lot of energy. That's a lot I guess of energy so. I guess it's like, whoa. But um, I just want to say again, a shout out to our sponsors, uh, Global, Global Peace Walk, Workers .org, um, and all the work that's being done in Kenya and in America, and also with ILLI, the Institute for Leadership and Lifelong Learning. If you enjoy these kind of things, and you know, Sandy, we need to get you... Um, with a course on on the institute because we look at mind body spirit and um email me or have via email me whichever is you're choosing and let's talk about that i'd love to feature your courses it could be courses that you already have and we could be just another place that they could another placement for them so you are a delight I have genuinely enjoyed your calmness and your, your great spirit. Thank you so much for being on our show. Thank you, Temple, and thank you for that invitation. I would love to participate in your courses, and thank you for this amazing conversation today. It's really touched my heart and soul, and you're brilliant, and just thank you for the great message of health and healing that you're spreading to the world. Hey, we're in this together. We're in this together. And uh, again, get Dia to get in touch with me about you. Know, okay. Thank you. Bless you, dear. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate you. Thank you for tuning in. And may I just say that this could be the kind of program that you could go on YouTube and find it and send it to some of your relatives. Just saying. <laughs>